Hello, welcome to this section on NASDAQ systems. In this section, we're going to take a look at CATS, the Consolidated Audit Trail System, TRACE, the Trade Reporting and Compliance Engine, and of course, the important role ACT plays in transactions in the NASDAQ marketplace. Let's jump in and take a look at the role that CATS plays when orders are presented from customers. The Consolidated Audit Trail System, or CATS, replaced the old OATS system, and it operates in a similar capacity with several subtle differences. The first thing you want to be aware of if you're familiar with the old OAT system is CAT includes information on orders received for both equities and option orders. There also have been several subtle changes that have been made to some of the timing and reporting requirements, and we're going to go through those changes in just a few seconds here. But let's first talk about the role that CATS plays when orders are received by a broker dealer. The role CATS plays is to ensure that all orders are presented in, to the marketplace in a timely manner and that broker dealers do not hold back customer orders and use them to trade against them later in the day. So what CATS does, it effectively timestamps every order event in the life of the order. When the order is received, it is timestamped. When it's presented to the marketplace, it is timestamped again. If the order is executed, it is timestamped. If the customer changes the order, perhaps they change the limit price, well, that would have to be timestamped as well by the CATS system. If the order is canceled or times out, that order, that is, event is indeed time stamped as well. Now let's take a look at some of the information that's going to be recorded and reported by the firm for all CATS reports. It's important to note that every single order received by the broker dealer is going to require its own unique CATS report. And the information that is collected in this report is very, very comprehensive. So one of the things you need to be aware of is that pretty much all customer information is going to be included on the CATS report. It'll include the customer's name, their address, the account number, and their social security number, and it will also include the customer's date of birth. So a lot of customer sensitive information will indeed be included in that report for that order. Every single order is going to have its own unique identifier. So if Bob enters an order, it will have its own unique identifier. If Sue enters an order, it will have its own unique identifier, all collecting this very important and vital information to be reported by the firm to FINRA through the filing of its CAT submission. It will also talk about the terms and conditions of the order. I think that's pretty obvious. Was it a buy? Was it a sell? How many shares? Was it a limit order? Was it a market order? Was there a time and force modifier on that order? Was it a day order? Was it a good till cancel or GTC order? It will also record the market center in which the order was directed. Now, did they direct the order for execution to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange? Did they send it through the NASDAQ system? Was the order routed to an ECN? All of this information will be included in that CATS report. If the order is executed, the order will be noted as being executed as an agent or in a principal capacity. So what role did the firm play when it was executing that customer's order. Now, all orders that are collected and reported to FINRA through the CATS report must be reported by 8 a.m. trade date plus one. That is the next business day. So orders that are executed on Friday may be reported on Saturday, that's an important qualifier, may be reported on Saturday. However, they must be reported by Monday, the next business day, trade day plus one. And all CATS reports are required to be received by FINRA on trade date plus one by 8 a.m. Now, in order to ensure 
that all market participants are reporting and recording information on a timely basis, FINRA requires that broker-dealers synchronize their clocks to the National Institute for Standardized Time Atomic Clock. This is the central timekeeping agency in the world. Now, broker-dealers must synchronize their clocks before the market opens and should do periodic checks throughout the trading day to ensure that the clock is synchronized with the atomic clock within very, very small tolerances. So the broker dealer's clock must be synchronized to the atomic clock within 50 milliseconds of the time being kept or reported by the National Institute for Standardized Time's atomic clock. This is the variability that is allowed for electronic events. Now, when I say electronic events, when orders are routed and executed electronically, when orders are handled in a manual capacity, they are allowed to be synchronized within one second of this clock's reported time. So the clocks that are exclusively used for manual trading events will be synchronized within one second. Clocks that are used to record events that are executed or re routed or reported electronically must be synchronized within 50 milliseconds of this atomic clock's reported time. That's a very important distinction between the electronic handling of an order and the manual handling of an order. Now, all broker-dealers are required to record time in military time, that's hours, minutes, seconds, and milliseconds. So all of these events will be reported in military time down to milliseconds. Broker-dealers are not required to record or report transactions or events in nanoseconds. However, if the broker-dealer does indeed collect the information in nanoseconds, it would be required to be reported in nanoseconds by that particular broker-dealer. Now, let's take a look at the firm quote compliance system and how it is used by FINRA in order to ensure that market makers honor their quotes. When a market maker displays a quote, a bid and an offer for a security, they are required to honor those quotes at their displayed prices for their displayed size. If an order is presented to a market maker who has displayed a quote and that market maker fails to honor those prices, well, the market maker has engaged in a violation or committed a violation known as backing away. And FINRA takes these allegations seriously because it can impair the marketplace and the ability of investors to buy and sell securities. So here we have market maker one, and they're displaying a bid of 2025 and an offer of 2035. And they're looking to buy 2,000 shares at the bid of 2025. And they have 2,500 shares offered at 2035. Now, if a market maker is displaying prices, they must honor these prices. So if an order is routed to market maker one to buy 1,000 shares of stock at 2035, and market maker one fails to honor that quote and simply backs away, updates their quote and makes it maybe 2040 offered without filling that customer's order, well then the market maker has backed away. The broker dealer who had presented the order to the market maker who felt that they were entitled to a print or a trade at the displayed price could enter a complaint with FINRA or NASDAQ and ask them to review the time sequence of the market makers' quotes and when and how they updated their quotes. So FINRA will use the firm quote compliance system to look at exactly the timing of all the events, when the quote was displayed, when the order was presented, and if the market maker had just updated its quote because it executed an order previously. 
If a market maker updates its quote because it executed a prior transaction, a firm quote violation will not have taken place. If the market maker simply moved their quote without having affected a transaction, the market maker will have backed away and have been found to have violated FINRA's firm quote policies. Now, FINRA will use this firm quote compliance system to review all of the data, and if they find that the broker-dealer failed to honor the quote, the complaining firm will be entitled to receive a contemporaneous execution. That's test language for a transaction at the price that they would have received when the order was presented to the market maker. Now, the market maker's firm quote obligation begins when an order is presented to it for execution. If no order is presented and they simply update their quote, a firm quote violation will not have taken place. Now, a little bit of an interesting scenario can come into play where a market maker receives a phone call from an inquiring broker dealer wanting to get a quote for perhaps an illiquid stock and the broker dealer says, how do you have A, B, C, D? And the market maker says, it looks like a $10 bid offered $10.50. Well, that is a subject quote, right? That is not a firm quote. The inquiring broker dealer cannot hold that broker dealer to those subject quotes. However, if the broker dealer inquiring receives a subject or qualified quote, and the broker dealer who is providing a subject or qualified quote fails to subsequently provide them with a firm quote, prices at which they are indeed willing to trade, that is a variation of a backing away violation. So you wanna be aware of that on the test. Just a little bit of a subtle test point there for you. Now let's take a look at the important role that ACT plays in transactions executed in the marketplace. For your exam, it is incredibly important that you know exactly what ACT does and what ACT does not do. ACT reports transactions to the tape that have been executed. How do you know 500 shares of Apple traded at $140? Or how do you know that 1,000 shares of Intel traded at $60? Well, you see that on the tape because ACT put it there. ACT matches transactions between broker-dealers. ACT matches their market participant IDs and the firm's trade reports at the end of the day. It also reports completed transactions to the DTCC for clearing purposes so that the broker dealers know that they have to exchange cash and securities. ACT does not quote. It doesn't display quotes in the marketplace. It doesn't route orders to a market center, and it is not an execution system. This one slide is very well worth a few points on your exam. Definitely gonna be worth a couple of questions at the very least. ACT is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. each business day. Now moving forward here uh, with ACT, we're gonna take a look at some of the timing and rules and regulations relating to ACT. Now, the rule is written that all transactions must be reported as soon as practical, but in no event later than 10 seconds from execution. What does that actually mean? Well, that means that a transaction must be reported to ACT within 10 seconds of execution. But what you need to know is 99% of all trades executed in the NASDAQ system are executed electronically and therefore automatically reported to ACT. Therefore, there's nothing for a trader to do. It's all done for them. However, a transaction executed over the phone, well, that is required to be reported manually by that trader, and it must be reported to ACT within 10 seconds of execution. The reporting party is required to report the transaction to ACT within 10 seconds of execution. This is to ensure that the transaction is reported timely to the marketplace, i.e. the tape. That is so that people know the prices that stocks are trading at in the market. 
Now, once that transaction has been reported to the tape, the contraparty, the other broker dealer, has 20 minutes to accept that transaction, to lock in the trade between the broker dealers for the number of shares and the price, and therefore that will facilitate the matching and the clearing of that transaction. Very different time frames here, but the time sensitivity is really, really on the reporting side so that the marketplace knows in a timely manner what prices stocks are trading at. Now, let's take a look at how transactions are reported to act. And how transactions are reported to act is contingent upon where that order was executed. If we're talking about a transaction in a NASDAQ stock, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, what have you. That order is executed in the NASDAQ Market Center execution system, or what's broadly referred to as NASDAQ. And the trade input function, or the user interface that would report that trade to NAC, ACT is the tra Trade Reporting Facility, or TRF. You can think of this as kind of like an order screen that if you're going to order something online pops up and you enter your name, your address, your email, your credit card information, and you click submit and the order is submitted to whoever the vendor is, maybe it's Amazon. So the trade reporting facility is nothing more than a user interface that will allow the trader to input the details of the trade, buy, sell, stock, number of shares, price, side, et cetera. Now, if you are doing a transaction in a New York Stock Exchange listed stock executed in the third market or in the CQS, and that will also be executed in the NASDAQ Market Center execution system, and that will also use the trade reporting facility. Now again, it's important that you just know what these are and to kind of think of them as you know, that order screen on, you know, for an online purchase. Now, when you're looking at a transaction that was executed in the OTC market or the pink OTC, these orders are gonna be executed through dealer provided lines or through systems provided by qualified um, dealer marketplaces like the OTC Markets Group. These transactions are gonna be reported to act through the ORF or the Order Reporting Facility. It's very easy to keep this straight because OTC begins with O and ORF begins with O. So the order reporting facility reports transactions to act to the ORF where the NASDAQ market center execution system is used to execute trades for NASDAQ listed securities as well as for New York Stock Exchange listed securities trading in the third market over NASDAQ and again, that is the TRF for those reports. Now, it is important to understand how trades are reported to act for reporting and pricing purposes. The first thing you wanna know is all trades that take place in the market are wholesale prices, meaning they exclude commissions and markups. So broker dealers often charge commissions or markups to their customers for executing orders, but these are not reflected in the prices that are reported to the tape because they very well are irrelevant to the marketplace. They are between the broker dealer and their customer. So let's take a look at a transaction where we have a customer wants to buy 1,000 shares of QWER at $25. And that's going to include a 50 cent markup. Well, in order for a customer to buy 1,000 shares of stock at 25 that includes a 50 cent markup, the broker dealer would have to be able to buy that stock in the marketplace at 24.50 and then add their markup to that execution and charge the customer 25. So the transaction, if it's executed, will be reported to act at the wholesale price of $24.50. Another way of saying that is the transactions are reported to act at the protected price. Broker dealers are required to protect and display customer orders at the wholesale price. So if the broker dealer 
was a market maker and wanted to buy a thousand shares of stock for this customer based on this order, they would display a bid of $24.50. And that is the price that the broker dealer or market maker would report that trade to act. Now on the other side of the transaction, if a customer wanted to sell a thousand shares of QWER at 25, and that included a 50 cent markdown, in this case, the market maker would have to go in and display an offer for that stock at 25.50. That is the wholesale price. And when the transaction is executed, it would be seen in the marketplace as a thousand shares of stock being uh, traded at 25.50. And that 25.50 would be reported to act. Now the broker dealer is going to pay the customer that $25 in line with the customer's limit. Once again, the transactions are reported to act at the protected price. And when you're on the buy side of the transaction, you are going to subtract the markup to determine what price is reported to act. And when you are on the sell side of the transaction, you're going to add the markdown back in to determine what price is going to be reported to act. Again, it's always the wholesale price, always the protected price. All right, now let's take a look at some of the trace reporting and operational aspects. Trace is open from 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. And all transactions in trace eligible securities must be reported to trace within one minute of execution. So if a trader receives an order for a bond that is a trace eligible security and they execute that order at 6.10, well that trade must be reported by 6.11. Now, if they give you a scenario where a trader executes an order for a trace eligible security with less than one minute remaining to the close of trace, that trade must be reported within one minute of trace opening on trade date plus one, or by 8.01 a.m. Now, maybe they have enough time to report it before 6.30 for a transaction executed um, at 6.29. However, the transaction must be reported to trace within one minute of trace's opening on trade date plus one. Now let's take a look at kind of a outlier scenario that you could be forced to deal with. Oftentimes bond traders will do a basket or a portfolio trade containing a large number of bonds and they will execute this one bond portfolio trade at a fixed or set price and that may fixed or set price may also be executed at a spread rate over a reference price, perhaps 150 basis points over the 10 year treasury. That would be an example of a spread price. So if we have a portfolio transaction executed at a fixed price or a fixed spread price containing 10 or more bonds, they can report this to the tape as a single portfolio transaction and append the portfolio modifier to that report so the marketplace knows that multiple bonds were included in that report. It has to be 10 corporate bonds, at least 10 corporate bonds. And what you will use to determine the number of bonds in the transaction is the QCIP number or the security ID for that specific issue. You will not use the issuer, i.e. XYZ or Apple or Microsoft, or what have you. It is the QCIP or the security ID that will be used to determine if the transaction qualifies as a portfolio transaction and can be reported as one trade with that portfolio modifier. If the portfolio contains both corporate debt and agency debt, you're only going to count the corporate debt and only the corporate debt will have the portfolio modifier appended to it. It's also important to note 
that it can only be a two-party transaction, one buyer and one seller, not multiple parties engaging in the transaction at the same time. So some good information there on that test point. If you see it, again, it is a bond portfolio trade or a basket trade. Now, let's take a look at the ADF, the Alternative Display Facility. FINRA was required to provide an opportunity for broker-dealers to quote, display quotes in other venues other than NASDAQ because many years ago, NASDAQ was really kind of the only area where people could display bids and offers for NASDAQ or over-the-counter securities, and it could theoretically have been deemed to be a monopoly. Now, we're going back many years before we had multiple, multiple market centers and so much order fragmentation, but this was you know, kind of the history of the development of the ADF. The alternative display facility operates from 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. And it's important that you know that the ADF only displays quotes. It does not provide any execution systems. If you display a quote for Microsoft in the NASDAQ system, well, NASDAQ provides the execution lines or systems or the connectivity to execute that order. If a broker dealer elects to display a quote from Microsoft in the ADF, well, NASDAQ does not provide that connectivity or the ability for people to electronically execute or route orders to those displayed quotes. It only displays quotes. Now, if you are going to elect to display your quote for a security in the ADF, you're going to have to contract with a third party to provide that electronic access to your quotes. Now, there are certain speed tests that the connectivity provider and therefore the market participant must meet in order to display and quote securities in the ADF. The maximum must be two seconds to turn around an order, meaning they execute the order at the displayed quote, and they get a report within two seconds. There's a maximum of three seconds for communications between the two parties if they are communicating back and forth. So it's two seconds for execution or reporting, three seconds for um, communication between the parties. Now, NASDAQ is going to continuously test these third uh, party connectivity providers access to the quotes for the broker dealer. And if the broker dealer fails this test three times in five days, they're going to be prohibited from quoting any security in the ADF for 20 days. So perhaps a market maker or a broker dealer is displaying quotes in the ADF for 20 or 30 stocks, but only one stock fails the speed test. Well, they're out of the ADF for 20 days on all stocks. So an important test point for you there. Now, let's take a look at some more particulars relating to the ADF. Well, ADF transactions are reported to act through the TRAC system, T-R-A-C-S. It is the TRAC system. So, you had, we went over the TRF, the ORF, and now we have tracks, and then it's used for the ADF. It's very important you know what is quoted on the ADF and what is not. The only securities that are quoted on the ADF are NASDAQ listed securities, such as Microsoft, Apple, and Google, or New York Stock Exchange listed securities, such as IBM, General Electric, and so on. What are not quoted in the ADF are securities traded in the OTC market or pink OTC. So no OT securities will be displayed in the ADF. Now let's take a look at some additional marketplaces and alternative uh, venues for executing orders that have developed over you know, the years. 
Uh, dark pools are traditionally referred to um, as areas where orders are routed and executed anonymously, and those depths are not seen by market participants. You have to be a subscriber. So some of these are crossing networks or electronic trading platforms. And these are mostly used by large institutional subscribers who wish to anonymously execute orders in these networks without causing market disruption or market impact. Now, it's important to note that even though the market participants may not see this because they're not subscribers, these market centers or dark pools are still subject to the NBBO rules, meaning you cannot execute orders at inferior prices. They have to be executed at the best bid or the best offer. Now, the gray market is a marketplace that is used for securities that do not qualify for trading on the OTC markets at nor the pink OTC. These are issuers who have been kind of booted off all of the electronic and publicly available trading platforms because they have no information about them, right? They're not current on their filings. Therefore, they do not qualify for the electronic display and quotes of their securities by market makers. These dark, uh, this gray market is, you know, very, very, very speculative and customers should pr quite frankly, never execute orders in gray market securities because it's only phone interaction between market makers and God only knows what prices are going to be um, executed for securities. So, All right, now let's take a look at ACES. ACES is a system that market makers can use to provide direct electronic access to their quotes or their internal book to other broker dealers. Now, let's say you're a large market maker and a large clearing broker dealer, and you're providing services to correspondent broker dealers, and you want to give them access to your quotes and your internal book to route orders because you want the order flow. Perhaps you're JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, and you provide these clearing and custodial services to other smaller correspondent broker dealers, and as a courtesy to them and as a benefit to you, you provide them with the access to your market making quotes and your internal book to route orders directly into your system. So if the correspondent was going to buy or sell a security in a NASDAQ listed stock, it wouldn't go out into the marketplace, but it would go right into the market maker's internal book. Now there are a couple things you wanna know about this system. And the first one is that the market maker can turn off this access at any point they want to. Perhaps there's a flash crash and the market gaps down a thousand or two thousand and they don't want to get picked off or they don't want to get flooded with all this order flow. They hit the switch and the ACES system is turned off and none of their correspondence or other broker dealers that they provided ACES access to can route their orders directly into the book. If the market stabilizes, they can flip the switch and ACES is back on. So that's an important test point for you. It can be turned in on, on and off at any point by the market maker providing the ACES access. Also, there's going to be a fee associated with this access. FINRA or NASDAQ is going to charge the uh, providing broker dealer a fee. And those fees are charged to and paid by the market maker providing the ACES access to other broker dealers. Now let's take a look at directed and preferenced orders. These are orders that can be entered into the NASDAQ market system. And we're gonna start off with directed orders. A directed order may be a liability order or it may be a non-liability order. A liability order is one which the market maker must execute. They have no choice. So let's say that an order entry firm who doesn't make markets enters an order to buy a thousand shares of XYZ at $25.
and they direct that order to market maker one who they have a deal with to receive a little bit of a rebate on order flow. And market maker one is offering the stock at $25. They are the, at the inside market for that security. Well, that directed order would be a liability order. The order matches the inside market and the market maker to which the order was directed is also at the inside market. Therefore, market maker one in this example would be obligated to execute that order that was directed to it. However, let's say the order entry firm entered an order for, to buy a thousand shares of stock at $25 and directed it to market maker one when the ins 